Amy Tillotson graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in art with a concentration in industrial design from the University of Wisconsin Stout. Amy's design career included designing trade show exhibits and graphics, print communications, set design and set building for corporate events. From 2009 to 2010, she participated in the Women's Art Resource of Minnesota Mentorship Program and studied with Jante Vischer. Amy left the design world to raise her two children and began making art from her home studio. In 2020, she moved to Northeast Minneapolis, where she maintains a studio in the Northrop King Building, creating mixed media art. Well, welcome, Amy. I'm excited to talk to you about your artwork and your creative practice today. Um, Amy and I connected a couple of years ago. I showed her work at uh, a gallery I was working in and was very impressed with her approach and her insight into life and creativity. So I'm really excited for Amy to share that with us today. So Amy, talk a little bit about um, your creative process and the mediums you work in and uh, help us understand uh, your work. Thanks, Jeffrey. I'm glad to be here. Um, well, my process is, it's, it's all about process for me. I work in mixed media and really enjoy experimenting with materials and different techniques. And um, some of the techniques I use are collage and um, printmaking and, um, of course, painting and even a little bit of Scraffito, um, scraping into surfaces and creating texture that way. Um, and so I've been painting for about 17, 18 years, but I do have a background in art and design. And um, I guess my process is complemented by, I like to go for walks and capture images that are interesting to me. and it. They might not be interesting to anyone else, but they seem to help inform my work. Mm -hmm. Things like cracks in sidewalks, or when you see that the city has come through and repaired the cracks in the asphalt with tar and toilet paper. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I just see things like that and, and I, I look back on them. I don't know that they um, appear in my work, you know, straight away, but I think that there is some connection there. How do you use that um, inspiration? So if you're out for a walk and you see an interesting shape, um, do you just remember it? Do you stop and sketch? Do you take a photograph? I take a photograph with my cell phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how does, how do you bring that into the studio then? Well, for example, um, the show that I had with you at the gallery, um, that was all inspired by some hat forms that I found at a thrift shop that are wire hat forms that I then um, photographed on a piece of dark paper and it created shadows. And then I take that into Photoshop and I drop out the background and I get the line work. And um, that pretty much informed the entire series that I did. Um, and other, other ways I end up just looking at cracks in the sidewalk, almost like it's a um, aerial view of a landscape or a map. Okay. Um, I worked as a trade show exhibit designer and I did a lot of drafting and um, both on paper and using CAD. So I always had this sort of mentality of looking down and um, I don't know, I think I, a lot of my work ends up appearing like an aerial landscape um, just by default. Um, I'm getting a little bit away from that now. I've been, since I've had the studio, I've been working larger and trying new things and new materials and um, for me, it's really just been about creating. I'm not trying to stay within certain boundaries. I'm just, it's more important for me to just be here and work. I, uh, I like that. Um, 
I think there's times where uh, we get caught in the idea that we need to be producing work uh, for other people. And um, that starts to take on a whole different life for itself. And being able to go into a space and make work that is interesting to you and solely for you, I think is a really great way to approach it. One of the things you mentioned was um, pulling the images you take on your phone, on your walks into Photoshop. And I think that's a really interesting aspect of your process that um, you use them in a digital form uh, in the beginning stages of your work. How do you take it from the digital form into a painting or a collage? Well, sometimes it can be literally um, a digital image printed on paper that gets collaged in. Um, sometimes I use them as a template and I cut a stencil from that imagery and um, stencil in that imagery. Sometimes I, I'll replicate it on tracing paper and collage it into a piece. Um, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it just sits in the back and doesn't get used at all. But I do think that it is um, ruminating back here somewhere and will eventually show up in a, a piece of work. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about the stencil aspect of it. Well, I, I will trace it out on acetate and cut out the image. And then I'll use um, acrylic with um, a roller like this, a printmaking mm, roller. Okay. And I will take the ink or the uh, acrylic and um, roll it into the stencil onto the painting or onto paper. Um, a smoother surface, obviously, like panel works best. Does that create lots of different layers in your work? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'm really excited about exploring layers and translucency and I've been trying to incorporate more and more of that in my work. Um, so the nice thing about using stencils is that they obviously block out what you don't want to paint, um, but you can actually use them in reverse and paint the edges of the stencil. So it's like this positive negative effect that can happen. Um, what I'm really excited about is that my studio mate has, he owns lasers and he, mm -hmm. once he gets settled here, he's said that he would help me cut really big stencils. And I think that there's something really exciting that could happen with that, but I'm not there yet. So hopefully in the near future. Yeah, you mentioned that you're starting to make larger works. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the before works, the size and why you feel um, compelled to make them bigger? Well, um, you know, it depends on the type of work that I'm doing. And uh, with the pandemic, I had just, you know, moved, just moved into a new studio, was just had kids home from college. And um, I decided that I was going to jumpstart things by signing up for a virtual workshop uh, via Zoom, um, working large on paper with mixed media. And I love working on paper, but I've never worked on anything large. And so in this workshop, they encouraged us to work on works that were 52 by 52 inches. Mm. And um, that, that was a really, it pushed me. It was a really interesting experience because working large, everything has to scale up. The brush strokes, the amount of paint, the space that you need, the physicality. And um, it was really challenging two weeks. Um, and funny, funnily enough, afterwards, I started working on pieces that were five inches by five inches just to give myself a break. Um, 
but I'm excited to go back there and uh, and try working large again and and um, rejiggering the studio will allow me to be able to do that. It's quite messy. What what did you um, gain from that experience? Um, trusting myself, mm -hmm. pushing, um, you know, they, they kept telling us, you're not painting a painting. You're not painting a painting. You're just getting information down on the page. And, you know, to just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And then at, at a certain point, you have to just kind of go, okay, now it's time to refine the work and what is, what needs to be done. And um, that was that was hard uh, to, I find editing really hard. Um, and I think sometimes my work, I'm kind of a more is more type of person. So okay. sometimes my work gets really crazy and I have to rein it in and um, that's hard. And so like this piece behind me, that was one of the large pieces it was so crazy that I decided I need some sort of structure in the piece. And so it became linear and that really helped. Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm just trying to grow. I'm trying to learn new things. And I'm also trying not to be too hard on myself. <laughs> while that can doing be it. challenging. I, mm -hmm. I find it interesting that you, you talk about editing yourself and I can see the connection um, to your design background, because often mm -hmm. you have an idea and you have the ability because of technology to edit and go back and forth. Could you talk a little bit about the, that juxtaposition of the design elements that you're used to and then working with more analog elements where you don't get to easily edit or switch back and forth that you have to kind of just continue to develop with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's very different. And I think that had I had I created or painted prior to becoming a designer, I think I would have been a better designer. Um, that's for sure. I think uh, it's interesting. Actually, the way that I work is probably really informed by being a designer by the fact that I like to use collage and um, stencils and things like that, where I have a little more control. And I think that that probably comes from some of the design and graphic design background that I've got. Um, can you repeat the question? <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. Sure. Uh, I was just wondering the, um like the challenges or the connections between a design type of approach where you can edit and kind of toggle back and forth because of technology and the similarities and challenges and working with uh, painting and collage where you know, once the paint's down, you don't get to press a button to remove it. It's kind of down and- Well, I have learned to embrace gesso. Okay. <laughs> the artist white out. Um, but I think that that's, um, it's, it's good to know, at least with acrylic, I can go back in. So I think that just knowing I can go back in, I can sand something out, I can scrape, I can, um, that, you know, it does, it's okay. I can make mistakes. And some of those are going to be good mistakes. And so it's just a matter of sussing out what stays and what goes. How did you get to the point of wanting to paint? I was really terrified of paint in college. I liked everything to be neat and orderly. I liked to draw. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I just was so needed a, to, once I left the design world to raise my kids, I needed something that was going to fill that creative void. And so I would, at night, I'd paint. And um, then as time went on, I started to get interested in a lot of different media and techniques. 
I went through um, the WARM program, Women's Art Resources mm -hmm. Minnesota, and they had a mentorship program that would connect protégés with um, mid-career artists, women artists, and it was a two-year program. And um, I, that was just invaluable, not only to have that experience and the my mentor telling me, you know, to get the most out of this, you're going to have to really focus on one thing. And um, and so she really helped rein me in. And then the other valuable thing from that experience was the connections that I made with other women artists and to see that they too were experiencing um, either motherhood or, or a second career or um, coming into the art world later in life. Um, and so that was, and I still see those people. I still connect with them. It's been 12 years now mm. and um, we meet pretty faithfully. The pandemic put a curb to some of that, but every three weeks. So um, we're, they're an amazing group of women that uh, work in different media and we support each other, share resources, um, critique each other's work. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, the experience of working with a mentor? That is um, something we haven't really discussed much in this series is um, connecting with another artist that has more experience and the value of working with someone uh, in that relationship. I think it would be a, a nice thing to share. Could you expand on it a bit? Sure. Well, um, my mentor was Yancha Vischer and um, she was a, still is a very established artist. Um, she was instrumental in starting the WARM program. Hmm. And uh, in Minneapolis, she had, they had participated running a gallery. Um, so she had a breadth of experience behind her. And I think what helped me as an artist was she too had been a mother and had been married and, you know, just balancing the home life with my creative ambition. And um, she would really try to get me to hone in on ideas and really push them um, beyond where I felt comfortable. And, you know, I think that that's good for anyone. Um, she, as she was a pretty straight shooter, you know, she would tell it like it is. And, and I appreciated that and, um, but n never in an intimidating way. You had talked about um, your fellow mentees in the program and how you continue to uh, remain in contact with them, that uh, you kind of created this really great community can you talk a little bit about what um, your role in a creative community is? Well, I see that um, my community is on different levels. Um, having now moved to Northeast Minneapolis, which is called the Northeast Minneapolis Arts District, um, home to many, many studio buildings, many artists, a lot of them live in the area. Um, that community, is very welcoming and um, there's a lot of support here. There's a lot of support for artists in general in, in Minnesota. Um, and I just really appreciate that. We've got Springboard for the Arts, we've got um, minnesotaarts.org and um, of course, NEMA, Northeast Minneapolis Artists Association. Our building has an association. So there's just a lot of support for artists here. Um, on a smaller level, I just love coming to my studio building because everyone here is coming here with a purpose and they really wanna be here. Um, recently with the pandemic and, and them having to, they closed the building down a little bit and reduced hours and um, it took a while to 
open it back up to the public. And of course we have um, COVID guidelines and masks and social distancing and all that to make sure that everybody stays safe. Um, you know, a lot of these artists, this is what they do for a living. They need to make sales in order to continue to rent studio space and continue to do what they do. And so, um, I, you know, we've tried to be open as much as possible when we're allowed to, because um, I think it was Paul Wellstone that said, we all do better when we all do better. And I think that not only do we do better, but maybe, and the jeweler down the hall does better, but also the taco shop behind the building might do better and the coffee shop. And, you know, it's, I can't tell you how many people have come through this space and just thanked us for being open mm. because there's so few things to do and places to go during uh, COVID. And, um, you know, it's just really rewarding that they appreciate us just having our doors open. So, and I'm hoping that the, the artwork is um, a salve for them, you know, uh, that it's healing too with the times that we're, we've been in. Sure. Uh, have, you, have you continued to think about what your role will be uh, as we leave the pandemic? or as we kind of, what we term going back to normal, mm -hmm. what kind of role do you see yourself in, in your community um, post-pandemic? I can see myself eventually, you know, becoming a mentor to uh, a younger artist um, or someone new. I do enjoy that interaction. And um, I think that there's so many resources here that a lot of people just don't even know about that it would just be um, rewarding sharing that information, sharing from my experiences. Well, let's test out your mentorship. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what kind of advice would you give to somebody, uh, maybe a high school student that's considering a, a career in the arts? Um, what would you encourage them to do? Well, I would encourage them to go to college if they can, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's, you know, four-year program, uh, community college. And um, I'd, I encourage them to talk to as many people as they can who have a variety of experiences. Um, I would encourage them to also become savvy with social media. Uh, I hate to say it, but I think it's here to stay and it's going to be more and more important uh, for artists to get their work out there. Um, and, you know, to not be afraid. Uh, there's, you learn so much by making mistakes. And um, you know, I know that there are people that are, that are just like terrified to even pick up a brush or a, or a piece of charcoal and draw, you know, that they just automatically assume that they can't do it. And um, it's taken me a while, but I feel like it's just so much better to do than not to do. <laughs> and um, also learning that You just need to forge ahead. I, I do this um, thing called capturing flow. And when I get stuck, I, I, it's, it's a way of trying to work without judgment. So if I had a mentee, I would, or a protege, I would um, try to talk to them about just keep moving, just keep moving. Don't let your head get in the game. That's where I get into trouble. And um, if you can just keep making marks and 
what I do is I set up a series of uh, rules that I have to follow. Um, I'll get 12 pieces of paper that are all the same size and I will um, say, okay, I can only use these colors, I can only use these shapes, uh, I have to have an organic element in there, um, you know, maybe five different rules, change up the scale. And as I work, I'll take one piece of paper and, I, and if I get stuck, I set it aside, I go to the next one. And the whole idea is to just keep rifling through, don't, don't get up here. And okay. um, it's just a really wonderful exercise and I've created some work that I've really enjoyed from it and I've gotten um, positive responses from that. So my challenge to myself now is to try and implement that on a larger scale. Hmm. Is, is this a process you use on a regular basis? Yeah, I, I created these little ones here that are These were all part of just using mm. similar colors, different shapes, but that it works great for um, designing a series, but it's also a great exercise just to have limits, but of course you can break the rules too. But, sure, sure. Um, so I would, you know, I think that could be a valuable thing to teach um, someone that is just starting out is just just do, you know, don't let your head interfere with what's in here, you know? Sure. Amy, in the past, you, um, you had some really interesting work that I remember exhibiting that used a deconstructive um, screen printing process. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, well, I, it's a process that I learned from a woman named uh, Kerr Grabowski, and she used that process on textiles, mm -hmm. and I wasn't interested in doing that on textiles. I wanted to do it on paper, and I asked her, and she said, oh, sure, you can do that on paper. But in fact, later I found out that she wasn't sure if it would work on paper, but it did. And um, so basically what you do is you, you gather materials that are textured or um, it could be like crumpled up paper, it could be screen material, fabrics, um, anything that doesn't have, that is less than a quarter inch thick. Hmm. And you make an arrangement on your table and you take a screen and you put it over those elements and in, in her case, she used Procyon dye, which is a dye used in textiles. And I did use that on um, as well. And you mix it up with a, um, what is it called? Something called alginate, and it's made out of algae. Um, and you pour that along the top edge of your screen and you draw it down and you let that dry. And what happens is it picks up the image of those pieces that are underneath the textural elements and it gets sort of trapped in the screen. Hmm. You clear away those elements and then you take your fabric or your paper and the, these, the fabric has been treated with soda ash so that it can accept the dye. Um, but with paper, I didn't do anything. Um, so I put my paper underneath, put the screen back down after it's dried, and then you pour this alginate um, at the top of the screen and draw it down. And what it does is it re-wets the screen. Mm. And um, therefore, when you, as you keep drawing it down, it makes an image on the paper. Um, it's usually, I mean, you might be able to get one good print and then maybe five ghost prints after that which are lighter and not as detailed. Um, so it's definitely more of a mono print type of mm. screen printing. But I, I was so fascinated by it and it's so immediate and interesting. Um, I tried for years afterward to find a way to do something like that 
that didn't involve Procyon dyes. Um, one, because it's there's a lot to mixing the dyes and it's they can be really harmful if you inhale, inhale the uh, pigments. Um, and unfortunately, I never, I never found out another way other than I suspect there's a way to do it with watercolor, mm. but I haven't, um, I haven't gone there. Part of the problem was that I didn't have a place where I could wash and rinse out screens. Um, but I believe that Kerr is still teaching that and um, you can go on Google and she has a YouTube video uh, that someone could watch if they are interested on deconstructive screen printing. And how did you use it in your artwork? Well, so I had all these papers then that I had this monoprint on and I wasn't sure what to do with them, but eventually uh, I found that hat form that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that had these interesting lines. And I decided that I was going to incorporate that imagery within um, these mono prints. And so a lot of times I ended up um, cutting out stencils, or I'm sorry, cutting out paper and collaging it into this background or I would cut a stencil with that imagery and um, I would end up stenciling acrylic paint onto these pieces. And they all did, I mean, the texture alone ended up looking very topographical in a way. And so these became pieces that sort of talked about different pathways and um, I love the patterning that happened naturally from the process. And have you um, discontinued that process at this point? I have. Um, however, I have. I have more pieces of paper that have magically uh, worked their way into other artwork as collaged pieces. Well, thank you. Uh, for sharing your process and your work with us today. Uh, you. you have a different approach so far from um, the various people I've talked to. And I, I think it's very fascinating um, that you share that with us because it, it uh, shows us the variety of creativity that's out there. And I think your process mm -hmm. is uh, somewhat unique. And I love that. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jeffrey. I enjoyed talking with you.